Thank you for joining us tonight for the Race in the Law session. My name is Georgette Vihel. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach. A few quick items to note. Your screen name should be listed as your first and last name. If it isn't, please update your profile in video settings. Your first and last name allows us to identify you so that you receive credit in your CLE affidavit. You're invited to introduce yourself using the chat function by typing in your full name, grad year, where you work, um, or anything that you would like to share with a group. Please note, this is an interactive session. You can ask questions during the presentation using the chat function. Presenters will respond to questions following the presentation. After the Q&A, you will be randomly assigned groups to discuss the topics outlined in your program at cu.law slash program. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of Colorado Law. Dean and I is an internationally recognized scholar and author in international human rights and issues concerning indigenous peoples. He served as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2008 to 2014. In addition to his teaching and scholarship, Dean Anaya has litigated major cases involving Indigenous peoples, human rights, and domestic and international tribunals. I also want to take a moment to recognize that this is the last Race in the Law lecture, and I want to sincerely thank Dean Anaya for his initiative in implementing this series, which has been so constructive in this time of national turmoil. Please join me in welcoming Dean Anaya. Thank you, Georgette. Uh, and thank you, uh, Georgette, for all the hard work you've put in to making this lecture series a success and contributing to the vision of what it's about. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you're, you're all doing well. Um, let me add my thanks to you for joining us for this evening's lecture and discussion um, in this installment of the Race and the Law series. Uh, this evening, we're, we're pleased to have Professor Ahmed White um, uh, speaking, who will talk about, uh, his, his talk is titled, The Diversification of Inequality, the Question of Class and the Politics of Inclusion. Um, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples on whose traditional lands the University of Colorado is located. Um, as you know, the, the Race and the Law lecture series is, is part of Colorado Law's anti-racism and representation initiative. And as I've uh, expressed before, uh, an, an overarching goal of the initiative is to enhance opportunities for learning and, and, and reflecting on, on racism and its uh, continuing effects and, and on what, what each of us can do uh, to defeat it as, as, as lawyers or, or future lawyers and citizens. Um, this lecture series has been a, a key component of how uh, we have pursued uh, th this goal. And I'm grateful to today, today's speaker and all of the faculty and lawyers who have participated in, in the series. And again, grateful to, to Georgette for co contributing to the vision of the lecture series and, and providing the wonderful support throughout. Um, and before I introduce our, our, our speaker, I wanna, wanna welcome uh, Professor Jennifer Hendricks, uh, who will join us following the presentation to moder moderate the Q&A. Um, Professor H Hendricks uh, joined the CU uh, Law Faculty in 2012. She teaches family law and civil procedure and related courses, um, and her biography is available in tonight's program. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ahmed White, the Nicholas uh, Rosenbaum uh, Professor of Law. Uh, before arriving at the University of Colorado, he was a visitor at uh, Northwestern University in 1999. Uh, much of his work concerns the history of law and labor relations from uh, the early 20th century through the New Deal period, uh, as well as the, the viability of a functional system of labor rights in, in a liberal society. Uh, these themes surface in many of his articles over the last decade or so, and and they are, are central to his acclaimed book, The Last Great Strike, A Little Steel, the CIO, and the Struggle for Labor Rights in New Deal America, um, which was published by University of Colorado, sorry, University of California Press uh, in 2016. 
the themes also feature in his second forthcoming book, uh, which I've had uh, I've had a, a, the privilege to look at the, the manuscript, and 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 it is uh, it's going to be a treat for readers. Um, that book is uh, is tentatively titled the, "The Romance and the Suffering: Law, uh, Violence, and the Tragic Fate of Radical Industrial uh, un Unionism in 20th Century America." Um, that book will also be published by University of California, uh, California Press and expected to be out uh, later this year. Uh, Professor White is widely known as a highly original and insightful thinker who's, who's geared uh, his work to advancing uh, social justice by understanding the lessons of the past. Uh, you can take a look at, at Ahmed's detailed biography uh, in the program uh, to learn more about it. So with that, I'm happy to turn the program over to Professor uh, Ahmed White. Thank, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you for those, uh, those very kind uh, remarks. Uh, let me also quickly thank Yesenia and, and Georgette, who have uh, been wonderful in working with to, um, to, to get everything in order for this talk. Uh, and I, I thank as well uh, the students who uh, have been um, behind, in part behind this initiative. Um, and, and I thank all of you for being out here today, as well as my, my friend Jennifer, um, who, will, uh, who will be moderating. Um, of course, all of the thoughts I'm gonna express this evening are, uh, are my own, uh, which uh, might alert you uh, to uh, their, their potential for controversy and whatnot. Uh, in some ways, I, I might be a little casual with you. I don't know how long I can keep this jacket on uh, before it gets too hot. In other ways, I'm, I'm going to treat this in a relatively formal way as a lecture, uh, meaning I've, I've some prepared remarks, um, and I'm, I'm going to more or less stick with those remarks, although um, I hope you'll find them uh, suitably engaging. Um, and so with no further ado, um, let me get to it. The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. The class, which is the ruling material force in society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class, which has the means of material production at its disposal, has control at the same time over the means of mental production. So said Karl Marx 170 years ago in a book called The German Ideology where he with Frederick Engels attempted to work through the relationship between intellectual thought on the one hand and history and social structure on the other. Their most essential conclusion that generally speaking social structure mediated by the interest and power of the powerful determines which ideas predominate. As social structure changes, so do dominant ideas. In our day, what this means is that the underlying determinant of truth is capitalism, a social order defined by wage labor and private ownership of the means of production. It also means that the arbiter of this truth is a ruling class, an assortment of powerful corporations and individuals in whose hands are vested the means of production and the wealth and power that come with this. What I will argue this evening is that this observation or insight about the relationship between ideas and social structure is of vital importance in understanding the state of civil rights in America. More particularly, it is essential for understanding how civil rights has been reshaped and perverted by the extraordinary inequality and the rule of oligarchy in our day. And it is essential too for unfolding the crucial and problematic role that the concept of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion has played in this process. Just as it's fashionable these days to call oneself a socialist, it's also common for people to claim to be Marxist. Would that it were as fashionable to actually read Marx and understand what he had to say. Uh, Marx was always part of my intellectual wardrobe, you might say. I first read Marx as a teenager. Uh, at that young age in my life, his work was on the same shelf uh, as three others that stamped me clearly and have influenced my way of thinking ever since the Gospels of the New Testament, the books and stories of Jack London, and the works of Franz Fanon, um, one of whose volumes I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see a colleague reading a while ago. Of course, I read much more than this and certainly have continued uh, to do so since my younger years. Uh, 
And of course, my way of thinking about the world can hardly, was hardly shaped only by books. I am black, not Creole, not mixed race, not BIPOC, not even African American, a word that was imposed on me and mine when I was nearly grown. In fact, I would say all of these words except black are mere descriptions for me, not ways by which I comprehend who I am. And even being black is not something I ever chose or have felt any need to perform. As my friend Earl, a Métis activist in Northern Canada quite eloquently insists about himself, my identity is something I have always simply lived. I grew up in Louisiana in the 1970s and 1980s. My mother, an educated and industrious woman, was often without a job outside of the home. And the reason for this is that her husband, my father, was a civil rights lawyer. Not the kind with a vacation home, nor the kind with multi-million dollar cases involving police brutality or school abuse, um, nor least of all the kind that powerful people regularly indulge with fawning media appearances, political appointments, and good turns for family. My father could have had all of these things if he had given up being a civil rights lawyer, at least as he understood that calling. But this, as an aged Greek radical told me and my wife a few years ago, describing the fate of a labor martyr in this country and his own refusal to accept the Nazi occupation of Greece, this was something he simply could not do. And so my father worked for 50 years as a civil rights lawyer of the sort nearly extinct today, who struggled mightily for little pay and with few resources, who was harried and hassled politically and socially as he worked to integrate public institutions and open up jobs and programs for the benefit of everyday folk in places you've never heard of. Unlike my father's more well-heeled acquaintances in the civil rights movement, for instance, Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, both of whom he knew and who both sent their children to Georgetown Day School, my parents were sure we, uh, we were educated in one of the school systems my father was trying to desegregate. So it was that for 13 years, I attended the public school that my father's father helped to build, uh, which precisely because it was not desegregated was also without air conditioning or proper heating, without anything resembling advanced placement courses or a class in calculus even, or a proper athletic equipment or anything of the sort, and whose student body was overwhelmingly black, poor and working class. This school was but a mile from the small cotton farm where my father was born, as he, despite being one of only six black lawyers in the whole state at the time of his graduation, elected to return whence he came and to fight his battles there. I tell you all this to give you some context for understanding what I'm moving towards saying, and also to lead you to a more specific point about the civil rights movement where it was a half century ago when I was born. To do this before I tell you what it's become today and what this has to do with DEI and with the quote from Karl Marx. 50 years ago, the civil rights movement found itself at a turning point, one nowhere more clearly evident than in the life and person of Martin Luther King Jr. Just as he resolved that the movement was destined to fail if it did not confront the reign of American capitalism. King's views on the matter are well recounted by Harry Belafonte. In his 2012 memoir, Belafonte describes a meeting at his New York apartment in March 1968 with King, with King's lawyer and bodyguard, and with Andrew Young. As Belafonte recalls, King expressed his solidarity with young Black workers and poor people who were dissatisfied with American society and dissatisfied with what the movement had delivered. Said King, it's just the tactics we can't agree on. I have more in common with these people than, I, than with anyone else in this movement. I feel their rage, I feel their pain, I feel their frustration. It's the system that's the problem and it's choking the breath out of our lives. In the pause that followed, Belafonte says, Andy, Andy Young replied, well, I don't know, Martin, it's not the entire system. It's only part of it. And I think we can fix that. Suddenly Belafonte recalls Martin lost his temper. I don't need to hear from you, Andy, he said. I've heard enough from you. You're a capitalist and I'm not. And we don't see eye to eye on this and a lot of other stuff. It was an awkward moment. Martin was really angry. 
but I understood the subtext, said Belafonte. Deep down, Andy was ambivalent about the poor people's campaign and King's priorities generally. As Belafonte concludes, the tension peaked. The trouble, Martin went on, is that we live in a failed system. Capitalism does not permit an even flow of economic resources. Within this system, a small privileged few are rich beyond conscience, and almost all others are doomed to be poor on some level. That's the way the system works. And since we know that the system will not change the rules, we're gonna to have to change the system. A week later, King was dead, assassinated while supporting a garbage man strike that some in the movement urged him not to bother with. In saying, I am not a capitalist and castigating those in his circle who were, and in supporting those workers, King resolved that a genuine meaningful measure of racial equality could not be achieved within the institutional confines of American capitalism. And it was not only in Belafonte's apartment that he expressed this view, should for some reason you doubt Belafonte's reliability. As King made these sentiments and frustrations evident elsewhere, especially towards the end of his life, he described his struggle as a class struggle and said capitalism was evil and had outlived its usefulness. By coming to terms with capitalism in this way, King rejected the view only then becoming fashionable, but soon strongly associated with the likes of Andy Young and Jesse Jackson, that a different path was possible, that liberation could be found within the structures of capitalism, if not also via a concerted program of black capitalism as it came to be called. King's view on the matter was shared at the time by a great number of other activists, from the Black Panthers to my own father, for all these figures, unlike for Young and Jackson, equality implied not only a revolution, but a healthy measure of revulsion and circumspection about the institutional and personal embodiments of capitalism. King, it bears emphasizing, not only rejected capitalism, as Belafonte recalled, he rejected being or becoming a capitalist and was uncomfortable working with such people. In the three decades that followed King's death, American capitalism's hold on our society has only grown stronger with dire consequences for much of black America. Deindustrialization, the collapse of labor intensive small scale farming, a development that by the way was ruinous for my family. The fiscal crisis of state and municipal governments, the politics of law and order. Every one of these factors converge with the everyday workings of the economic order its remorseless logic of exploitation and concentration of wealth to plunge a great part of the black community into permanent crisis. The product of this in a racist society has been escalating inequality, manifest not only in where blacks stand relative to whites and most other ethnic groups, um, but particularly there or most noticeably there. The statistics here are striking. The 30% gap in rates of home ownership compared to whites, a 10% difference in college completion rates, a three-year difference in life expectancy. With regard to the rawest measure of economic well-being income, the data are just as troubling. When I was born in 1970, median black household income was adjusted for inflation about $30,000 a year compared to about 55,000 for whites. Today, the figure is about 40,000 for blacks and 75,000 for whites. One can easily muster other statistics that tell this same story, but there's a different story to be told here, which is how under the governance of capitalism, inequality has grown within black society. Again, uh, basic st statistics suffice to make this point. In 1970, the upper limit of the bottom fifth income bracket for all households was about $22,000 in 2019 dollars. Then in 2019, it was 28,000. For blacks, the relevant figures are about 13,000 in 1970 and 17,000 in 1919. For whites, including Hispanics, the relevant figures are 24,000 and 31,000. By contrast, in 1970, the bottom limit of the top fifth of black household income was about $100,000 a year. In 2019, that figure was about $192,000 a year. This increase, which is again fully ingest, adjusted for inflation is quite unlike the statistics for the poorest quintile, nearly equal to the rate for whites. 
what it shows is how, at least in terms of income, affluent blacks have gotten richer at roughly the same rate that affluent whites have. And as this class has held its own with whites, it's left the black lower class well behind. This pattern of increasing inequality within black society holds true by other measures. Incarceration rates are a notably tragic uh, measure of income of inequality between blacks and whites. For decades now, black incarceration rates have been five to eight times the rate of whites. But as black incarceration skyrocketed in absolute terms and in comparison to whites and other groups, this increase has occurred almost entirely among less educated and generally poor and more working class blacks. In the late 1990s, at the height of the drive toward mass incarceration, only 1.6% of blacks in state prison had a college degree or greater, about twice the figure for whites. While the tendency of black unemployment rates to be roughly double that of whites has held true for decades, the disparity is significantly greater among blacks without a college degree, along with, of course, the overall rate itself. Although racial disparities in household wealth actually increase with degree of education, this seems to be an artifact of lower overall black home ownership rates and the fact that black property values are undermined by rank racism, among other factors. At the same time, though, residential income segregation among blacks, which was considerably lower than other races than for other races 50 years ago, has increased dramatically to the point that it is now considerably greater than among whites, black flight. In 1960, my father went to law school at a still fully segregated institution in Louisiana, Southern University, the same university, in fact, that I attended as an undergraduate. He worked his way through school painting houses and on the docks, and with crucial support from his oldest sister who picked cotton and clean houses for white folks. When he began practicing three years later, there were probably about 2,000 black lawyers in the United States. Today, we black lawyers number about 65,000. Likewise, in 1960, only about 3% of blacks had earned a four-year college degree. Today, the figure is about 26%. Enrollment figures at elite schools tell an even clearer tale. 1960, a total of 15 black students enrolled at Harvard, Princeton, and Yale combined. Now blacks comprise seven, between seven and 15% of undergraduates at Ivy League schools. It was in 1960 as well that the great black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier estimated there were only about 25 black millionaires in the United States. Today, there are maybe 300,000. This current figure, which represents about 2% of black households is only a fraction of the figure among whites of whom maybe 18% or millionaires or live in the households of millionaires. But it also contrasts strikingly with the fact that about half of black families today have a net worth of less than $7,000. And most of these people, about a third of blacks overall have a net worth of zero or less. About five years ago, there was a flurry of reports from think tanks and a range of journalistic outlets from the New York Times, to leftist publications like the World Socialist website, to Fox News even, commenting on and summarizing this data. There was, you might say, just a bit of a reckoning. Um, at that time, writing in the Huffington Post, a lawyer and commentator named Antonio Moore summarized the situation when he declared, if Black America were a country, we would be among the most wealth stratified in the world. This extraordinary rise of inequality within black society is evident in the transformation of the black elite, rooted in changing realities about who constitutes this elite and what sorts of interests and values it's bound to advance. 50 years ago, top black celebrities and especially the politically active ones like Harry Belafonte lived relatively modest existences. It's one reason there are only 25 black millionaires in the whole country. And so did MLK, who was hardly a millionaire. He made $8,000 a year as a preacher and donated the $50,000 he received in winning the Nobel Prize to the civil rights cause. Malcolm X, according to the late Manning Marable, who taught here at the University of Colorado, was so short on funds during his first trip to Africa that he had to worry whether he could afford a few souvenirs for his family. <laughs> 
At the local level, the leadership of the civil rights movement was of similarly modest standing, ranging from lawyers like my father, teachers and tradesmen who eked out a middle-class existence if they were lucky, to people like Fannie Lou Hamer or some of my own relatives, often deeply impoverished, who made a living cleaning house or growing cotton or sweet potatoes, and yet were also active in the movement. I could go on at length about how my own family struggled despite my parents' education. I won't do that. But what I will readily do is confirm what some of the better students of the civil rights movement have said about how much the demands for fair pay and a decent living for themselves and their communities was a foremost motivation for such people, my father included. The days when everyday folk dominated the civil rights movement and when the movement's elites live more or less like everyday folk are long gone. King's death ushered in a period of sustained crisis for the movement as it struggled to find its footing in a country marked by backlash, changing demographics, and a changing economy. I can't speak in detail about everything that befell the movement in this period and how this evolution occurred, but suffice it to say the movement confronted or conformed itself rather to these changes and not for the better. Following the shifting locus of power and influence in America and in black America and becoming in the process unmoored from the communities of working people and modestly situated professionals who were once its base and finding a new base and a new identity among the wealthy and powerful. In fact, I would be remiss if I began talking about what the civil rights movement is today without pausing to reflect on whether it can still be said to exist at all. Indeed, it does exist, but only as something transformed as much by class as by anything else. This can be seen most clearly in who counts or counts him or herself among its putative leaders. You have, for instance, billionaire celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, Beyonce Knowles, and Sean Jay-Z Carter, wealthy athletes like LeBron James, who is supposedly knocking on the door of billionaire status. You've got wealthy and well-positioned journalists too, if you wanna call them that. Don Lemon and Nicole Hannah-Jones, for instance. And then you have the corporate class represented by the likes of Kenneth Frazier, CEO at Merck, who recently earned great plaudits for leading opposition to Georgia's new voting law. Such is the triumph of black capitalism, if not as a mode of salvation for black America, it's not that, then as a new basis of black leadership. The civil rights movement of today is also staffed by plenty of elite academics, many of them graduates of or faculty at Ivy League and other elite schools. It has become absolutely commonplace for academics these days to commodify racial injustice, to produce scholarship that in the name of civil rights, markets alluring bromides about struggle and allies and intersectionality as something critical and politically relevant. Scholarship that has a way of concluding, not in demands for authentic structural reforms, least of all economic ones, but alas, in more diversity of the kind that justifies these figures' own careers. This is what they are selling in the critical words of radical black scholar Adolph Reed, an undivided product of self and work. Nevertheless, many of this ilk are presented by themselves and major media as important activists for what they write and say. If all this did was displace more trenchant critique, it would be bad enough, but that's not all it does. The career of Ibram X. Kendi shows his peddling of anti-racism has made his ideas a staple of corporate management and earned him millions while allowing his clients and acolytes to posture as champions of racial justice while doing little to change the way these patrons do business, let alone surrender their prerogatives as capitalists. If you don't believe that people like Oprah, Kendi, and Don Lemon are in fact representative of today's civil rights movement, search that very term on the internet and behold the results, not only in feature articles in major newspapers like the LA Times and in venerable black oriented magazines like Essence, and not only in the aptly named outfit Diversity Inc, but in the fashion of this class from itself, in Oprah Daily, for instance, or CNN. Again, if there is a civil rights movement, these are the people who comprise it. You might say they have taken ownership of it. There are still lawyers in this movement, uh, but in recent decades, figures like my father and even Thurgood Marshall, who for all his faults, led a relatively modest and sacrificial existence, 
have been utterly replaced by a different class of people. Nationally and regionally, the top civil rights firms, and I use that term loosely, tend to be multi-million dollar operations, often housed in small palaces, festooned, as I've seen many times, with cannons and waterfalls out front. And then you have organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, founded by Marshall, and where my father was a cooperating attorney, albeit one who, like dozens of others in his position, received little support from the organization in the decades that he struggled to handle major desegregation cases on his own time and with perpetually inadequate resources. LDF's legal defense funds, core of national officers, consists today of a retired Stanford law professor, a partner at a global law firm, and a former vice president at United Parcel Service. And its board, eight people who are present are former partners in counsel at major corporate law firms, nine who are officers at large corporations like Uber, one who is the son of one of the world's most famous billionaires, and only one who is a civic leader independent of such associations. And then too, you have the affluent politicians, beginning with the Obamas, who are closing in on $100 million in net worth, and who count among their holdings properties in DC and Martha's Vineyard valued in eight figures. Are people like this apt to demand in any serious way, as King did, that the end of racism in this country requires the end of capitalism? Speaking of Obama, at least 30 years ago, you might say, are there not many thousands of activists who don't fit this mold? Students and community organizers of modest means. Indeed, there are. But what is their work and what standing have they in contrast to the figures I just mentioned? The dependency of the Black Lives Matter movement on funding from the likes of Uber, IBM, and Airbnb, for instance, not only says something about that organization, it reflects a kind of dependency that's become ubiquitous among successful organizations of its kind. Perhaps more important to note, even at the most localized level, what passes for civil rights work is dominated by hundreds of thousands of local elites. Not unlike Obama, the community organizer, whose main claim to leadership is their affluence or proximity to the affluent. Influence is the name of the game, as even earnest people trade the principle of the old civil rights movement, which held as an elite of any kind, one was obliged, as MLK lectured Andy Young, to identify downward for the very different and more lucrative notion, which is that everyone is better served identifying upward. But of course, influence in this scheme like money flows downward. To be sure, as some of the statistics I cited a minute ago make abundantly clear, blacks are still not on par with whites or just about any other group for that matter, even in these upper reaches of American society. Blacks remain relatively uncommon on corporate boards and among law partners at high-end firms, just as we are underrepresented in the bar. There is still work to do, including in academia. By pausing in this way to emphasize that upper-class Blacks have not achieved parity with whites and other groups, I also want to make perfectly clear that I'm most definitely not saying that people of my race and class, as I am in fact part of the Black elite, are somehow fundamentally more responsible for the plight of lower class Blacks than are other elements of this country's ruling class. To say that would be to commit an absurd affront, not only to political morals, but also to how power and influence are distributed and wielded in this country. Nevertheless, the Black elite is in principal part the topic at hand and has responsibility on this issue. With this in mind, what is more important to note is that we find ourselves at a moment in history when there are enough affluent and upper-class Blacks to allow them or us to make their demands and interests identical to those of the race, and enough racial inequality within their or our class to make these concerns salient, not least to themselves. The ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class. I also don't wanna overstate my points. Uh, or invite you to do so. Organizations like LDF still do good work at times. On a more fundamental level, it pays to acknowledge that there is still a good measure of downward identification among elite Blacks, of the sort that motivated the likes of MLK and my father and countless others, and which has always made me especially proud to be a Black man.
The Black Lives Matter movement is problematic in various ways, but widespread support for the organization's central goals among Blacks of all social classes is certainly not. Equally heartening to me is continued support among Blacks for social programs and labor rights, uh, combined with continued skepticism about the state and the moral legitimacy and practical virtues of capitalism. But on these fronts, two things have changed in my lifetime. There is much greater comfort with extreme wealth, and especially since Obama's terms, with the doings of the government. What I find particularly troubling is the remarkable increase in esteem for federal police and intelligence organizations, the very ones that expended great effort trying to put people like King and my own father out of business, if not behind bars. Indeed, on the cultural front, you have Spike Lee's movie, Black Klansman, a civil rights film it's called, that celebrates the anti-Klan work of the same FBI agent who infiltrated and undermined black radical groups here in Colorado, including a meeting featuring Stokely Carmichael. You've got the movie Black Panther, roundly and rightly criticized by black radicals for its favorable representation of the CIA. In the real world, there's the recently released video by the actual CIA, using diversity to bolster its recruitment goals. As black leftists have long tried to argue, being black does not immunize one from class and the politics of class. And so it is with the black elite who have class interest and values apart from racial identity and who wield considerable power to shape values and priorities around race and who have indeed shaped those values in ways that align with their material interests and class position. Often this manifests itself in a preoccupation with episodic and sensational representations of real racism, particularly those episodes that can be universalized as if to demonstrate that race exists independently of class. Thus the ritualized way that um, the black elite, including uh, some I know well from my time at Yale Law School, present the very real problem of police violence in class sanitized ways as something that somehow is nearly as likely to envelop them even though the chances of this happening to a lawyer or a doctor or a multimillionaire or someone who regularly appears on CNN are quite small. The same is evident in the presentation of mass incarceration as something that could entail any black person, notwithstanding how relatively untrue this is. What might seem here like a positive kind of solidarity across class lines actually has a more problematic side. Or how better to posture as militants while ignoring or even trivializing problems that weigh so heavily, indeed almost exclusively, on Blacks without money and connections? How better to pretend that if class exists, it hardly exists in comparison to race? And why not do this if you're rich? And then, too, there's the veneration of Black capitalism. As my friend Cedric Johnson, a leftist political scientist who by happenstance grew up in my own hometown, observes, this kind of thing is sometimes done with a historical cast. Johnson recently called attention to the way the overdue memorialization of black, uh, of mass violence against blacks in the early 20th century has come to focus so much on the destruction of the so-called Black Wall Street of Tulsa in 1921. There is nothing inherently wrong with shining light on this outrageous episode, as Johnson makes clear. But why the appeal of a Black Wall Street, if not because it resonates with the values and interests of this elite, particularly when dozens of other episodes less evocative of lost wealth and the victimization of the prosperous define this period of pervasive race violence. Perhaps even more important though, for what I'm arguing today is how this new black elite has presented its own interests, our interests and values on the economic front as essential markers of racial progress. And it's here that the concept of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion reveals its foremost purpose. As an aspiration, I'll be clear, the concept is admirable. And it gives credence to the presence of people like me and many of you in institutions like this one. But that's not all it does. And it doesn't do this in an unproblematic way. DEI also gives ideological justification to a program that presents personal achievement and success within the framework of an unyieldingly unfair system as an integral kind of civil rights work in its own right, while displacing the ambition to achieve more fundamental claim change. From I have a dream, you might say, to living the dream. It fell to Jay-Z, 
the hip hop star eight years ago to give the most notorious vent to this. Criticized by none other than Harry Belafonte about his lack of activism, the billionaire responded with equal measures of contempt for an old civil rights leader and hubris bordering on clinical narcissism. His presence is charity, he said. Is this an inapt example? Am I wrong to identify Jay-Z as a civil rights champion? Don't take it from me, take it from the man himself, from his fellow celebrities, from publications like The Guardian and Rolling Stone and from civil rights organizations like the NAACP, all of which tell us that he is or has become a leader indeed. More to the point though, is the fact that uh, his comments represent something commonly said by more conventional representatives of civil rights such as the view of black politicians as well as prominent civil rights organizations. Again, Legal Defense Fund is an example, which share his habit of presenting the newest black CEO, college professor, judge, admiral or general in the military, the next billionaire, a sports team owner, or whatever or whomever, as important victories for the race. When I was a child, this kind of thing was not regarded as irrelevant. But it was often dismissed by people who were more serious about black equality as tokenism. And if not that, as Uncle Tomism. Uncle Tomism being defined not by a failure simply to align with the politics of the group, but in a more fundamental way, as an exercise in putting one's own interest foremost. Times have changed though. Representation matters, we are told, just as we are told that words matter. A lot more frequently, it turns out, than we are told how much genuine structural reform matters. Which reminds me of, and I think this is significant, the logic that the US Supreme Court employed almost two decades ago when, to the delight of many large corporations, the army, other representations of this country's ruling class and many civil rights figures, the court saved affirmative action. But at the expense of any real possibility, that affirmative action might be used as a means of advancing the interests of poor and working class blacks or other minorities for that matter. As you may recall, what the court essentially concluded is that affirmative action was best justified by the logic of positive stereotyping. Diversity contributions, it said, not remediation and certainly not structural change. In so doing, the court at once opened wide the door to DEI as a central purpose of civil rights activism, while also tailoring affirmative action precisely and almost exclusively to the interests of professionals and other elites. My class, I confess. To be sure, justifying the claims and interests of the black elite is not the only way of explaining DEI's prominence. The concept also helps to realign the traditional politics of civil rights, which emerged out of the black, freedom movement with those of women and other racial and ethnic groups, uh, with those of the disabled, with those of the GBLTQ communities. This in itself is not a bad thing, of course, but to raise this point is to raise difficult questions, which I can't answer today, about the class politics of those groups and the functions of DEI with respect to their communities. Even more important to say is that the interests of the black elite problematic though they are, are hardly the only reasons behind the perversion of civil rights or the problematic role that DEI has come to play in this realm. Indeed, how could these interests be so determinative in a society that's hardly dominated by black folk, elite or otherwise? Instead, this country is ruled by a class of powerful capitalists, a ruling class of thousands of incredibly rich individuals and corporations, backed by hundreds of thousands of the merely extraordinarily wealthy, and of which Blacks are only a small fraction. For a long time, merely to speak of such a ruling class was usually to be dismissed as crazy. Maybe that's still the case, but facts have a way when they become overwhelming enough of speaking for themselves. And this is exactly what has happened, is mainstream figures are now forced by the facts to endorse such a judgment. Take the work of Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, two mainstream political scientists who a few years back shocked their demure colleagues by concluding on the basis of extensive and careful empirical study of political outcomes that we indeed live under the rule of an oligarchy. In recent years, even the pages of mainstream media outlets like the New York Times, Newsweek, The Guardian, even Fox News acknowledge as much. This conclusion would not have surprised generations of black leftists from W.B. Du Bois uh, 
to Langston Hughes and Claude McKay, to Paul Robeson, to MLK and Malcolm X, it would not have surprised my father either, who like many other intelligent people, consigned by circumstances and choice to live shoulder to shoulder with the underdogs in this society, needed no academic studies or newspaper reports to tell them who really and truly runs this world. And who were never separated from such beliefs by the kind of prosperity that so often comes with abandoning the, the conviction, as King put it, that a true champion of civil rights could not also be a capitalist. The truth is we are indeed under the iron heel of an oligarchy as Jack London once wrote, and one whose interests are also aligned with the construction of a new civil rights movement in which DEI effaces concerns about class. It is not the least bit surprising that companies that uh, will fight and have fought tooth and nail against labor unions where blacks have long been overrepresented that fight to preserve their prerogatives to lay waste to communities with plant closings and pollution, that connive to avoid paying local taxes essential to proper schooling and infrastructure, and that most of all have paid black workers woefully inadequate wages and salaries if they've hired them at all, have given such enthusiastic support to the principles of DEI and to a program of civil rights that has been redefined in terms of these principles. The reason is that it allows them to co-opt and subvert demands for racial justice to embrace them, albeit in ways that leave unquestioned their own essential legitimacy and power. This version of blackwashing, as some have called it, is not always free. Its devotees have made tax deductible uh, donations to black colleges, for instance, although usually the more affluent private ones. They have pledged to hire more black professionals to integrate their boardrooms. But it's uh, not particularly expensive either. And it's often done in ways that more broadly expand the power of this class of people. Such as evident in the way corporations and the wealthy have recently in the fashion of true oligarchs and in the guise of promoting racial justice asserted their authority to veto odious voting laws. As I noted earlier, even as they celebrate their own role in this very moment in influencing the political process far beyond what any of us could accomplish. It's precisely in this way that DEI shows one of its most problematic functions as it turns civil rights discourse away from the kinds of troubling questions that might follow a few moments reflection on how Jeff Bezos' personal wealth of $200 billion or the lobbying power of Delta Airlines is in any way compatible with voting rights. Or about how Oprah Winfrey could possibly have anything to say on the subject of equality when her net worth is 65,000 times the annual income of the average black family in America. What the representatives of, these class, of this class will not do, of course, is propose in any serious way um, to remedy a situation in which half of black households are worth less than $7,000. The reason they won't is that they cannot, not without abolishing themselves as a class. This is King's point. And why even pretend anyway, when by the lights of DEI, they can be warriors for racial justice on the cheap, while likewise superintending a fundamental change in what we think and don't think about inequality in this country. Again, the ideas of the ruling class. Nor is this kind of thing the province only of corporations and foundations and individual plutocrats. The reworking of civil rights around principles of DEI is also common among government officials who revel in tokenism and racial gestures like the kneeling episode in Congress last summer. And the same thing is evident among colleges and universities, especially the elite ones, which have at once obscured and legitimated their shameful roles as engines of inequality by embracing the imperfect and sometimes frankly fraudulent equality of DEI. For them too, tokenism is key, as well as a steady stream of gestures capped by the renaming of buildings and programs, the creation of safe spaces and the enforcement of speech codes. I suppose that one way of reckoning what I've laid out this evening is to say that what has really happened is that the civil rights movement no longer exists, that I'm tilting at windmills. And I suppose on some level, it is inarguably right to say this, albeit in a way that proves the essential truth of MLK's judgment about the compatibility of civil rights and capitalism. 
As cultural critic Frederick Jameson famously said, it has become easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And so here we are 53 years after King's death with capitalism fully intact and what remains of the civil rights movement fully captive to its logic. This is not its fate alone, of course. Something similar could be, should be, said about feminism and environmentalism, for instance, which are also conformed to the realities of capitalism and also in the grip of the politics of DEI. Indeed, even socialism has largely made its peace with capitalism, surviving the world over and certainly in this country by putting aside its pretenses of overthrowing capitalism in favor of warmed over welfareism and Keynesianism and DEI. What this tells us is that if I'm at all right about the dysfunctions of today's civil rights and about its bases in DEI, I'm likely to be more right in the years to come. Our future is one of diversified inequality, but inequality all the same, of a sort that makes a mockery of any serious commitment to civil rights. We are destined to see more black billionaires, a growing black elite of which I'm a somewhat uncomfortable example, but we're also destined to see poor and working class blacks continue to languish in an abyss of poverty and marginality. My father passed away two summers ago after suffering years of dementia, going on in his dementia all the time about the struggle, about all that was left to be done. In many ways, what died with him was an older, more utopian and yet more coherent and promising vision of civil rights. I could remember his death for how little noticed it went among the new civil rights elite, even though aside from all his other labors, he was once president of the states in AACP, very large in AACP and probably the state's most visible activist. But far better to recall, as I often do, all the people of modest means, more than a few of them white, some of them foreign born, who honored him for what he'd done for them. He delivered for those people in the fashion of the old civil rights movement and in the spirit of King. No one said anything about diversity, equity and inclusion at his funeral, or for that matter, about how much money he'd made. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, so much for sharing um, that both that analysis and um, <clears throat> for sharing how it intertwines with your father's life and what you and career and what you learned from him and and from that experience. Um, everyone attending is welcome to put questions in the chat, and they've already started going. Um, Go ahead and make them to everyone. A few people have sent questions just to me, and so I'm going to try to sort them and combine them so we can get to as many as possible. Um, I wanted to start out with one, yeah, <laughs> with, uh, with one um, sort of asking about your your father's um, approach to civil rights and how do you think things would be different if people like your father had remained at the forefront of civil rights litigation. Well, you know, I, I think my father was, you know, obviously crucial to me, the most important civil rights lawyer in the history of the world to me. But the, the man I described was not unique. And I knew in Louisiana and other places, and I knew from him um, that there were dozens and dozens of men and women like himself uh, who were relatively marginal figures and who practiced civil rights in the way he did. And the way he practiced it was, was, was to not only practice civil rights, but rather to practice it in, in ways that weren't strictly formal, um, that involved um, a lot of off the books pro bono representation of poor people, working class people. Uh, my father was often paid and you name it. I mean, it's like a cliche or something you see in the movies, but in, in fish that, that people caught, some of his clients caught offshore on the oil rigs, um, musical instruments, um, 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 produce, uh, and often nothing at all. Um, he, he did not charge poor people. Um, you know, I, I, it's a complicated question. The answer to the question is complicated, but complicated in ways that, that, that point to or that point us to 
some very prosaic things. Uh, there's a reason I'm standing here in front of you today and not in my father's office on, on what used to be 516 East Landry Street, Opelousa, Louisiana, uh, doing what he does. And it's because uh, there's so much pressure in the culture um, to succeed, where success means if you get admitted to Yale Law School, you'd better go there. And where going to a school like that, almost any law school anymore, means incurring enormous debt, crippling debt, um, debt that forecloses being the kind of person my father was. Uh, there are other things going on. I think the community that existed uh, when my father was, um, was a younger man, is, it no longer exists um, in, in, in the places where he operates. So I'm sorry I don't have a succinct answer to that question, um, but, but there are a lot of things going on there. I, I think this does dovetail with the oft-mentioned issue of, um, of access to, to, to justice, of, of people having a lawyer. Um, to stand with them. In the cases my father did, he did dozens and dozens of major desegregation suits in Louisiana, most of them to do with school districts, but also um, other entities in the state, um, not-for-profit state entities, libraries, I mean, you name it. Um, but what he also did, and this was true of a lot of other civil rights lawyers in the South, was just the small cases just the small case. I'm not talking about individual grievances. That's important too, when someone was discriminated against or something like that. But, you know, some little entity here and there that was, that was, that was operating unlawfully uh, and, and that he had to, you know, that, that, that they needed a lawyer. Um, more of that is a good thing, but, but I'll leave it at that to get to some other questions. Let me combine a couple of questions specifically about DEI um, as a policy. Um, so as you know, it's becoming common in faculty hiring at universities for candidates to be required to submit a diversity statement, which generally consists of sort of pledges of adherence to the principles of DEI and attempts to demonstrate how the person has advanced those principles. Um, and so the, the first part of the question is, and maybe, maybe leaving aside some of the First Amendment <laughs> uh, questions around that, but uh, first part is, uh, if, if you were on the job market and you submitted this talk as your diversity DEI statement, how do you think that would go over? Um, and um, also on, uh, in terms of larger debates over the term equity, in DEI, um, do you have thoughts on a debate about equity versus equality and the claim that equity as a goal is not fair because it discriminates against the ruling class? Oh, so there are a couple of different uh, yeah. questions there. Now, this talk would, would probably not go over well if I were looking for a job um, somewhere, but, um, um, but I think that goes to the way in which I think the broader problem with this with, with DEI isn't that, you know, I think diversity is in itself problematic or equity in itself is problematic or inclusion is problematic, far from it. I think the problem is that the concept is itself formulated with every expectation and deployed in such a fashion that it trivializes those issues, that it, it, it does so by, by abstracting them and by broadening them. An institution can be diverse, can be completely diverse, can be fundamentally diverse at the same time that it is exclusionary, even in unlawful ways of particular categories of people. And that is in fact often the case with entities that embrace um, diversity. Um, there's also the issue of where the diversity or the inclusion or the equity um, lies. Um, in, in institutions that are inevitably stratified, where not everyone makes the same amount of money or has the same privileges in the workplace or all of that. Um, but I also think the problem even goes beyond that in assuming that the way to deal with racial inequality in America won't involve, to come back to King, won't involve a fundamental reordering of our society. I saw in the chat someone's question, do I have a solution that doesn't involve tearing down capitalism? No, I do not. I also don't think it is the least bit likely that capitalism is gonna get torn down. But I'm comfortable with being 
pessimistic. Again, I could invoke my father. I watched him in his last years before he became demented, consumed, consumed by the erosion of so much that he had struggled to achieve. And I watched him reconcile himself to that, not easily and not fundamentally and not thoroughly. He remained an, an angry and disappointed person and rightly so, but he did not live in the world of illusions and neither do I. I hope for the best, I expect the worst and I'm seldom disappointed. On that front, there was another question along the lines of um, what's to be done um, if there's not a solution besides tearing down capitalism and you don't expect that to be to happen, that puts us in the realm of harm mitigation. Um, and how do you think this sort of current legal structure of remedies, the rise of Title VII, um, contributes to the issues you've touched on? Is unionization going, you know, going back to or maybe towards a different kind of unionization? The path forward. It's hard to be optimistic about unions either um, these days. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's much in the offing there. Um, on the question of Title VII, individual employment rights, um, those have, um, you know, there's an interesting story that I almost told in the talk about Title VII and how Title VII emerged after a real conflict. Uh, among the two main champions of employment reform in 1963, 1964, the labor movement and the civil rights movement. The labor movement had a great deal of experience in lobbying, uh, in, in political activism, the civil rights movement did not. Uh, and in the middle of that were a bunch of lawyers. Long story short, there was another alternative to the one that was adopted. The one we have is one premised on individual rights uh, and individual litigation. Uh, what the labor movement folk were pushing for was something more structural. Everybody understood that the fundamental problem looming was a problem of mass black unemployment and underemployment. That was the main impetus for Title VII, mass black employment and underemployment. People understood that deindustrialization was already occurring and had to be gotten ahead of. And so what the labor people proposed was structural reforms, an industrial policy, and a system of workplace equity on a mass scale that wasn't hinged on individual discrimination claims, but hinged on making assertions about inequalities or structural inequalities in workplaces or even entire industries. That scheme was of course not adopted. And the one we have now, you know, it's certainly not, uh, not not useless by any means, but it works better for people like me than it does for people who don't make a lot of money to start with. And that's its fundamental problem. It's also not well suited to structural reforms because it is premised in individual litigation and the restraints, the restrictions on class action have made that all the more difficult to accomplish, but even class action, you know, not nowhere near what people had in mind in 1963 as an alternative. So in the last minute before we go to great out, great breakout groups, I wanna bring you back to Marx and class analysis from the beginning of your talk. Um, one often hears a sort of description of there are the owners of the means of production, there are the workers, and in between there's a sort of courtier class of academics and journalists and such um, who in exchange for some scraps are the ones who promote the ideas and the, um, give it the intellectual foundation. In some of your um, talk, it sounded to me like you were describing a sort of merger of the sort of very top of that class with the ownership class in terms of a few of those people becoming extremely wealthy and then the owners also taking over those roles. Um, is that perhaps some basis for optimism that the rest of the courtiers will reconsider their loyalties? <laughs> um, or is there a new class dynamics emerging there? Um, maybe different from how Marx described it. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, I freely admit, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think you're fundamentally correct in how you describe the the, um, the, the stratification there. Um, there's class as, as a matter of income, there's class as a matter of wealth, there's class as a matter of identity of the way people imagine themselves and also residency and you know various other kinds of things like that. 
Um, so I, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say this, um, I don't mean this talk to be an individual indictment of people, although I don't in, I mind throwing lobbing bombs at billionaires. Um, instead, what I mean to do is speak to where we are in social structure uh, in society and, and, and what, that, what that does in the way of framing our views of the world, of what's right, of what we should do, of what the government should do, of what other people should do. Um, and in, in that light, I think it's important to remember, I often remind myself of this, the world's changed from the time my father was a young lawyer. Uh, his taste and appetite on the amount of money he can make, you can make as a lawyer. Um, it's complicated, um, but I, I think part of what's going on here, and I think I mentioned this in the talk is, um, as, as you, in so many ways, as you become wealthier, as you associate with wealthier people, then you tend to embrace their values, uh, their sense of what's right, uh, their sense of what's wrong. And I think that's a major part of what's happened. Uh, with not, again, not just civil rights, but I mentioned the environmental movement, the feminist movement, you name it, with activism in this country in general. It has an upper class, class cast to it. And until, to come back to the point about optimism, if you wanna be optimistic in a meaningful way, you gotta confront that. Then you can be optimistic. But if you pretend that class is not the 800 pound gorilla in the room or whatever, then you're destined to be disappointed and probably to fail.